Hello, I'm Chris Anderson, and welcome to the TED interview. Okay, we have an exciting plan for the coming weeks. TED's main annual conference has converted to a virtual conference stretched out over eight weeks. That event is including a number of live interviews with people focused on how on earth we dig ourselves out of this crisis and start rebuilding a better world. The live audience are members of the conference going TED community who generously agreed to trade their paid conference passes for this virtual experience of TED. But we're eager for this content to be shared more broadly. So I'm pleased to tell you that we're releasing the best of those interviews right here on this podcast, starting today. Our guest today is Kristalina Georgieva, one of the most powerful women in the world. Certainly, if we're to escape from the mess we're now in, she is going to play a major part in helping us do that. She's the head of the International Monetary Fund. In years past, she was chair of the World Bank Group and also a European Union commissioner, where she helped the response to the euro area's debt crisis and refugee crisis. So she's no stranger to international emergencies. But it's safe to say she has never seen a crisis quite like this one. Today, we explore with Kristalina where the opportunities lie to build more stable societies as we emerge from the pandemic. She traces lessons learned from past disasters that can inform our actions today. And she brings a refreshing, I'd say almost defiant kind of optimism to the difficult questions we're confronting. So as mentioned, we recorded this interview live with the virtual TED community, and you'll hear TED's current affairs curator, Whitney pennington Rogers chiming in with great questions from the audience. So with that, let's dive in. Welcome, Kristalina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you just took on this role late last year, and within four months, boom, COVID arrives. That is one heck of an introduction to a new job. How are you doing? Well, I find um, strength in action. And so at the fund, we have been from day one on this crisis, leaning forward with everything we have to provide lifelines uh, to countries. And that means to people and businesses. Uh, We have received over 90 requests and we have uh, offered to 56 countries critical financial packages. I mean, you've described this pandemic as a crisis like no other. In what way a crisis like no other? Mm. Well, truly like no other. First, never before we will inflict on the economy consciously so much pain to fight a virus and save lives. We are asking businesses not to produce and consumers not to go out and consume. At the front, uh, we label this the great lockdown. Second, never before there would be such a rapid change of fortunes practically for everybody around the world. In January, I was in Davos talking about anemic growth, growth of 3%. In April, during our spring meetings, it was already minus 3%. In January, we predicted 160 countries to have positive income per capita growth. Now it is 170 countries with negative income per capita growth. Now, this we call the great uh, reversal, very painful. And three, uncertainty. We we always live with uncertainty, uh, Chris, but this time it is the uncertainty of a novel coronavirus that policymakers have to integrate. We at the fund combine epidemiological projections with our traditional macroeconomic modeling to see through that uncertainty. Uh, I must add to this, uh, I very much hope that when we go on the other side in the recovery, we can use a new term and call it the great transformation, make the world a better place. Well, I'll be excited to come on to that um, in a bit. Mm. But um, in this moment of responding to the crisis, the main 
tool that seems to have been executed, at least by the, the rich countries, ha, ha, has been this, um, mm. this massive economic stimulus to the tune of trillions of dollars. Is that a wise response? It is a, a necessity. And uh, uh, you don't hear the fund often telling countries, please spend, spend as much as you can. And that is what we do now. We do add to that and keep the receipts. Don't lose accountability to the citizens, to the taxpayers. Uh, the reason financial injection is necessary, these fiscal measures of uh, almost $9 trillion are necessary, is because when the economy is standing still, unless there is help, unless there is monetary policy stimulus, firms are going to go massively bankrupt. People would be unemployed. The economy would be scarred. When we go to the other side, this scarring is going to make the recovery much more difficult. Uh, so that is uh, a wise thing to do. And it helps the fact that central banks in major economies have been acting in a synchronized manner and that fiscal stimulus came really, really fast. This is how we see people uh, being able to go through this uh, 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 very, very tough time. But how far can it go? Because it's been described in a sense as, as printing money. Governments are issuing more and more bonds that have to be paid back at some point. Um, there's this term in economics, you know, the Minsky moment, where things can go very well for a while as, as um, everyone believes that you know, the, uh, the, the train can keep running, the cycle can keep turning, you know, that uh, governments have all this money. At, at some point, though, doesn't that break down? Do you worry that we may be nearing a Minsky moment where, like, Michael and Mary Poppins grabs his tuppence and starts to run on the bank? Is, is, there, is, there, is there stress in the international financial system now that concerns you, that makes you feel that we may be running out of headroom? Uh, of course, this cannot go on forever. I, for one, have trust in our scientists. I think we will see uh, breakthroughs and uh, uh, we will see also people and businesses getting accustomed to social distancing, to micromeasures that protect uh, from spreading the disease. We have seen very massive injection in health systems, so hospitals can actually treat people that are coming uh, for help. Uh, obviously, if it is to go for a le very long time, uh, we would be worried. For now, what we are projecting is that there would be a gradual reopening. We see it already happening in a number of countries. Uh, and we project for next year, 2021, a partial recovery, not a full recovery, unfortunately, but coming to a better place. Now, what helps us is something that I don't particularly love, but I see it as a positive uh, feature, very low interest uh, rates, in some cases negative. That allows this injection of fiscal measures and uh, liquidity to be sustained over a number of years. And uh, for now, we do not see on the horizon uh, any return to uh, increase in uh, interest rates. Uh, so low for longer. And that is, in that environment, a uh, helpful uh, feature. I mean, the financial crisis of 2008 kind of came perilously close to breaking the entire financial system. Arguably, it did that. By most people's calculation, this is a far worse impact to the economy overall. Did the world... Mm -hmm. learn something from 2008 that has helped us so far be resilient this time? What the world learned is that the financial system has to be tested and then strengthened to withstand shocks. And that is helping us tremendously today. The banking system is resilient and uh, even in the non-banking financial institutions, uh, there is more attention paid to how far can you go uh, without running into, into trouble. 
I would say, if you look around the world, the most important lesson then was build resilience to shocks. Those who have done it cope now better. And those who have not done it are in a much tougher spot. And actually for the fund, what we are praying is that we will come out of this crisis with this lesson about resilience being spread beyond the banking system. So we actually have this crisis management mindset for a world that is inevitably going to be more shock prone because of climate mm. and also because of the sheer density of economic and social life on our planet. In your role, you're paying special attention to the situation in developing countries. And um, it does seem that they're, they're facing a, a really terrible situation right now. Many of them have significant debt denominated in dollars. In the current crisis, their currencies are depreciating against the dollar, making it nigh impossible for them to execute the kind of injections, stimulus injections that uh, the rich countries are doing and seems to be the only way out. So that, that seems like a really dangerous cycle. Is there any way to break that cycle? Well, uh, let me uh, first separate countries that have built strong fundamentals. Uh, and now in this crisis, as we are receiving uh, incoming data, there are not very many, but there are still some positive surprises, and they come from countries that have built stronger buffers, stronger fundamentals, have been more disciplined during good times. Uh, but indeed, we do see uh, quite a number of uh, emerging markets, developing countries, faced with multiple pressures. They have the hit from the coronavirus, uh, many of them with weak health systems. Then they have the... Uh, high level of indebtedness from before the crisis, uh, which creates much more difficult environment for them, then many of them are commodity exporters. Commodity prices, oil price, they went down very dramatically. That hits them again. Many rely on remittances. Remittances shrunk some 20 to 30%. And then you have a, a, a number of countries that are highly dependent on tourism. Tourism is the hardest hit uh, sector or one of the hardest hits. So very tough for these countries. But this is why institutions like mine have been wisely created. Uh, the IMF, the World Bank, the regional development banks, we work very closely together in this crisis. Uh, the IMF Fortunately, that was one of the lessons from the 2008-2009 uh, crisis. Make sure that in the center of the uh, financial safety net is an IMF with financial strength. Uh, we have four times more money to lend today than we had then, from $250 billion to $1 trillion. And of course, we are deploying uh, these funds exactly for the countries that need us the most. And we did one more thing uh, with uh, David Malpass, the president of the World Bank. We called for a debt moratorium for the poorest countries to their official bilateral creditors. We uh, made this call in late March and in mid-April, the G20 agreed on this moratorium. Amazing, we had the Paris Club, China, the Gulf countries, all agreeing that we should not suffocate the poorest countries by asking them to pay their debts when their economies are standing uh, still. Is it possible that some developing countries are overdoing the lockdown policy? I mean, if large numbers of your citizens are already struggling to stay alive, isn't it almost like a death sentence to order them not to leave their homes? Well, Chris, one of the... Uh, most heartbreaking conversations I would have is with leaders of countries where they have to stare in the face a choice of people dying from the virus or dying from hunger. And it is uh, a very dramatic, uh, very dramatic situation for them. Uh, 
where you have a very large part of your economy being informal, where people live hand to mouth every day. But even there, countries are doing really well in uh, social distancing to extent it is possible. Uh, many of, of the countries in Africa were very early to step up uh, uh, preventive measures. Why? They learned from the Ebola. They learned from prior crisis that hygiene, taking any measure you can really, really uh, helps. Uh, so again, I cannot stress enough how important is solidarity with these countries. Whitney. Hi there, thank you. This is a wonderful conversation and we're starting to see some questions come in from the community. I'm just gonna turn over here so I can read. Uh, the first one we have is um, from Bill Elkis and it's a follow-up to something you were mentioning earlier related to the stimulus. Um, Chris Salina, uh, what are the prospects for inflation from such large stimulus? Uh, at this point, uh, we are not worried about inflation in advanced economies and in majority of um, emerging market economies. We do worry about inflation in countries that have weak fundamentals, no access to foreign exchange easily, where the only way to address the crisis is our help or the central banks printing uh, more money. And sometimes it's a combination of those two. Why I don't worry about inflation in advanced economies? Because countries that have their hard currency are putting liquidity in place, uh, but at the same time, they're not seeing a big expansion of uh, demand and prices being pushed up. So for these countries, at least for observable future, we don't see a way of going like after the Second World War in inflation jumping up. But if you are a poor country that out of desperation, with no access to markets, no access to hard currency, ought to somehow put money supply enough, uh, then inflation is going to be there. Uh, a very extreme case is uh, Zimbabwe, and I do worry there may be uh, other countries. So this is why we are so determined to engage with these countries early. Uh, and also look at some of the high debt uh, countries. Would it be necessary on a country by country basis to restructure debts to prevent that moving in a, in a desperate uh, direction? Thank you. And we, and we have one more question that I wanted to share from our, um, our community. Uh, this is from Keith Yamashita, and it's about sort of how we all can be involved in, in some of this change. You are tasked with macroeconomic and funding efforts. What should we do as citizens to help renewal and recovery? But it is uh, incredibly important uh, for all of us as citizens. And aside of being the head of the IMF, I am also a global citizen, uh, that we are to bring that notion of solidarity in a moment of crisis. Uh, it is very important that we do create that sense, we are in this together, we would get through it together. And please speak up on that. I was uh, for many years crisis commissioner. And one thing I learned is that majority of people are positive, good people. You can lean on them. And there is a minority that is hateful, and fearful and also very loud. So good people speak up, spread that sense of we are in this together, we'll get through it together. I'd love to expand on that and uh, just ask you a bit more about, about leadership, actually. You know, when people think of the nations that have performed best, 
uh, they often refer to, um, when I say best, best in response to the current pandemic, um, they often refer to Germany, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, Denmark, and Norway. Uh, when they think of those that have performed worse, they often think of Spain, Italy, uh, the UK, Belgium, Sweden, Iran, Brazil, Russia, and the United States. All but one of that second group are run by men. All but one of the first group are run by women. Is that a coincidence? Well, um, now, speaking... Um, um, a bit subjectively as a woman, I do believe that women are great to lead in a crisis. They are more likely to show empathy, to care about the most vulnerable people, and to be able to speak about that. Uh, they are decisive. I can say that for myself. They, we take uh, energy from action. And uh, we don't tend to uh, kind of mourn and complain uh, too, too uh, much. Um, so there is perhaps something to be said about the value of gender equality for the future. Bring more women <laughs> for this world of more crisis ahead of us. I mean, it's obviously hard to make generalizations uh, about gender of any kind, but I mean, I'm, is there also almost something about the embracing of nuance that women might be better at that than men? Men often, it's like, let's win, let's let's conquer. And um, in, in a situation like this, where it's all probabilities, it's like, it's there are so many complex dials to turn on this, this dangerous pandemic machine that we're trying to wrestle. L let me say something, Chris. We need everybody, and we need this mixture of um, experience, knowledge, and predisposition, men and women coming uh, together. I find it that it is uh, great to have different perspectives uh, when we make decisions. And then the, the chances of making a good decision are, are higher. So. We need each other, uh, but we also need to recognize is that, yes, there are certain things I have uh, seen it time and again. Women are more uh, willing to find a pathway to compromise. They're more willing to be corrected if they're wrong. Say, oh, okay, that's a good point. Let me integrate it in the way I think uh, about it. And so when you are in uncertainty, that is a huge uh, advantage in decision making. So perhaps talk a bit more about your own leadership in, in this moment. Um, I mentioned you've only recently come to this job, but before that, um, you were European commissioner, you dealt with humanitarian crises in more than one part of the world. And in your own country, Bulgaria, you witnessed the wholesale transformation of the country, both politically and economically. What lessons can you bring from, from your past experience mm -hmm. to this moment? Well, there are, there are many things I learned, uh, but let me highlight uh, three. First, how critically important it is to prepare for a crisis. Kind of think of the unthinkable and then act with some foresight when a shock hits you. Preparedness, prevention, pay off big time. The second, and not necessarily in priority, it is as important, is collective action. Working together, seeking help, offering help, makes a huge difference in uh, emergency. And the third is something I learned time and again. We don't know our internal strength until we are hit. We are so resilient, we are so able to withstand shocks, especially when we come uh, together, that this always gives me this uh, sense of uh, optimism that uh, as hard as it is, we can overcome uh, it. From the days when my country collapsed, the economy collapsed, I would get up at four o'clock in the morning, queue to buy milk for my daughter, to the days when I would see Syrian refugees in terrible situations 
helping each other to today when I'm uh, the head of the IMF, uh, that internal strength, our power of resilience, uh, the more we are together, the more it is amplified. Actually, could you talk a bit more about the role of the IMF, especially as we look forward to trying to recover from this? What, what specifically can your organization do to take us forward? So there, there are three things that are uh, quite unique for the IMF, and they're really so important in a time of crisis. The first one is uh, to give a good diagnostic of what is happening and what is the way forward. Uh, let me just say, in this crisis, in the very first weeks, we put together, we call it policy tracker for 193 countries. What actions are countries taking? How they can learn from each other so they we can be more effective uh, together? We are adding to it now actions for responsible reopening of the economies exactly with that purpose. What we are known best for, we are the financial first responder. We are coming in this incredible shock with very significant financial firepower. And uh, what people don't know is that the fund has multiple instruments. Emergency financing is the one we doubled for this crisis. And it is no conditionalities. We are asking one thing, Chris, pay your doctors and your nurses, your hospitals, protect your most vulnerable people and parts of the economy. That's it. This is the condition. And the third thing we we do uh, at the fund is to help countries have the capacity for good policies. After the uh, uh, financial crisis, we help many countries to have good debt management, good fiscal management, transparency and accountability to improve uh, the performance of uh, public finance. I mean, this is a global crisis. A lot of people are worried that, unlike perhaps even in 2008, where it really did seem there was a lot of global cooperation, there's actually, in some worrying ways, less this time. Um, are, you, are you worried about how crucial is that to getting us through this? I mean, my, my preoccupation is uh, uh, in our mandate, in my area of re- responsibility, bring the membership together. We have uh, almost the whole world 189 countries are our members. And so far, I am very impressed by how responsive the membership has been. I put in front of them uh, in the spring a package, very strong package of measures to expand the role of the IMF in the crisis. Everything that we ask for, we ask for doubling uh, emergency financing, we got it. Very interesting. We ask for tripling concessional financing, exactly because, you know, like the virus hits uh, people with weak system the hardest, the crisis hits weak economies the hardest. So we wanted to triple concessional financing within one month. We got it. We asked for grants for debt relief. We got it. So what I'm trying to say here is that we need to focus on ways in which we bring the world together and then act on that rather than complaining that maybe not everything is the way it should be. Do your duty to the, to the global community. Well, indeed. And, and the IMF is, is dependent on the financing from its members, its key members. Yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, you, you spoke of the trillion dollars that you are looking to make available to nations that need it. As, as I read it, that, that comes from, you've got these units called special drawing rights. That you, you basically draw currency from members. And it, hasn't there been pushback, though, from the U.S. to, to block that, um, that effort of raising all that money? So the $1 trillion is uh, from our quotas and also from our ability to move money from well-to-do members from the advanced economies and lend it at very low or zero interest to the developing emerging markets. And we have this one trillion. And what was very interesting, not everybody noticed that, the U.S. in their $2 trillion 
stimulus package included the support for the IMF. The special drawing rights uh, is something that we indeed don't have yet consensus among the mem membership to do. It was done during the uh, uh, 2009 uh, crisis, issuing liquidity, and it goes to everybody. And uh, there are many voices, including mine. I spoke to the G20 about, uh, about that, that are saying, well, that may be a good thing to do now. It is not being supported uh, for, for reasons. It is not, not just capriciously. The problem with special drawing rights is that when we issue them, they go to all members and the advanced economies get 62% of the new allocation. Mm. And there are some that are saying, can we think of something that is more directed or exclusively directed to those who, who need it? But Chris, everything is on the table for us. As, as the crisis unfolds, uh, we, do, we need to do more. We bring the membership to do more. Whitney. And so we actually have a question from the community that sort of builds on what, um, what you're discussing right now. Um, Yavnika Khanna asks, uh, which countries will prove to be resilient in the great transformation? Those with popular leaders or those with sound financial systems? You know, they both matter. Uh, countries with strong fundamentals are clearly going through this crisis with less trauma than those that had weak fundamentals to begin with. And of course, leadership bet matters. How you mobilize a country for, for action matters. Uh, in my view, what we would see on the other side, the winners would be those who think today of this crisis also as an opportunity. Uh, clearly, digital transformation is a huge opportunity. Moving uh, to uh, e-learning, e-government, e-payments, e-commerce, linking uh, small and medium-sized enterprises through digital to consumers, big winner. Uh, secondly, I, I very much hope that we would come on the other side with low carbon footprint, and a more climate resilient uh, economy. Those who move in this direction, they would reduce the risk for themselves and the world from this other crisis that we are not talking so much about these days, but it hasn't gone anywhere. And you know, if you don't like pandemic, you are not gonna like the climate crisis uh, at all. Uh, and also countries that are thinking of how to make the uh, economy in the future a fairer economy. In other words, mm -hmm. we have been seeing inequality building up before this crisis. Uh, my colleagues uh, who have researched pandemics have a very bitter lesson for us. After uh, SARS, after Zika, inequality goes up. Well, are we going to let inequality to go up, up after this crisis. And if we do, we are damaging the fabric of our societies. And my sense is that hundreds of millions of people in this crisis would much prefer to have simpler, fairer, more equitable world to live uh, in and definitely more sustainable world. Definitely. And, and just one more question from our community before turning it uh, back to Chris for, uh, for, for some final questions here. But, um, you know, as you, this one is from uh, Sarah Ruckheimer. And uh, the question is, what do you see as the main potential positive shifts and changes in, the, in this world from this pandemic, say, two to 10 years from now? Well, the, uh, I, I touched upon it a, a little bit. Uh, uh, first, um, I hope to see uh, fiscal policy to help us recover, to be geared towards uh, green recovery and more equitable recovery. And that is something that is in the hands of policymakers. It can be done. Uh, secondly, I very much hope to see 
us integrating what we have learned from the crisis in terms of uh, virtual work. My organization, the IMF, well, we can shrink our uh, carbon footprint dramatically just by sustaining the practices we are developing now, and we will. Uh, I certainly hope to see in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the future much more attention to two things that we saw in this crisis are essential. Universal access to health in some form, uh, strong health systems, as well as strong social safety nets. Uh, built as automatic stabilizers in a time of uh, shock. And by the way, it is cheaper if we do it in this way. The bill for everyone uh, is going to be uh, smaller. Uh, and also, I, I very much hope that this notion of investing in people, recognizing that now that we see this horrible tragedy, the loss of lives, uh, that investing in people is the very best investment we can make. Mm. It's, it's so inspiring, actually, hearing the energy that you're bringing to this. I don't think many people coming into this would have expected to hear from the head of the IMF this emphasis on, you know, let's, let's solve the climate crisis, let's tackle inequality and injustice. Um, it's... Um, do, do you really believe that this moment, this crisis, could help lead us into a great transformation? I mean, people will feel it's your job to sound positive. You have to do that. Do, do you really see the path forward that we can um, get get through this? And how? What sort of time scale are we talking about here, Kristalina? Well, you know, one, one thing I learned from uh, the uh, transition I lived through the uh, transition from center planning to markets is, uh, it is tough, it is long, it is painful, and it is a road that takes turns. So I, I don't have an expectation of miracle from here to there. Uh, but I genuinely believe that um, we are now in a point of our history when people demand from their leaders safety and security and a society that is not torn apart by conflicts. And that is actually not unusual to see. So I would turn the table a little bit uh, on you, Chris. After a war, we see the world coming together and, and building a better world. Why not after a pandemic? And yes, we can make mistakes and not take the right route uh, to uh, travel, but we certainly have an obligation to try to get on that uh, road. Everybody matters for that. So if you could inject one idea into the mind of everybody um, or into the world leaders who listen to you, what, what would that idea be at this moment? Optimism, build a better world. Possible, desirable, we must do it. That sounds like optimism as the stance, not just a naive belief that it will happen, but a determination to make it so. That's what you're calling for, to use that as the motivation to pull us all forward together. Uh, Chris, worries won't help. Positive action will positive stay positive so that's my message Love that. well i have to say thank you you know it's incredibly inspiring actually to see your uh, energy and your determined optimism let's let's call it that uh i think we wish you the very best as you use your position to help get us out of this mess <laughs> thank you so much Kristalina, for for spending time here at ted thank you That's a wrap for this episode. This week's show was produced by Ted's amazing media team dispersed in different homes in New York City. 
Our mix engineer is David Herman, and our theme music is by Alison Leighton-Brown. I hope you all stay safe. See you next time.